This video is going to be an overview of some of the historic Protestant concerns about venerating icons. The goal is not necessarily to try to convince people on the other side, though that would be wonderful if that happens, but especially more of a focus of just explaining what a Protestant view is. I actually think many Protestants benefit from that because many Protestants don't really know the history of what our views might be on an issue like this. So hopefully this could be helpful. This will be a longer video. I've got some history to get into. Um, it is not going to be comprehensive. There's so much to this issue that probably just cannot cover right here. But what I'm going to do is really put the focus on church history and kind of explaining a Protestant view of uh, how the practice of the veneration of icons develops and how a Protestant looks at that. And I'll give kind of a, a sketch of three different phases of development. And then I'll kind of conclude this video with some summative final thoughts and uh, expressions of the Protestant point of view. And I'll put those in the form of a question, trying to do this as fairly and charitably as possible. I'm open. This issue, like the last video I made on relics, is one I'm not a total expert on, but I've done enough work on it that I thought it might be useful to uh, make a contribution to the dialogue here and uh, trying to, again, trying to explain kind of a historic Protestant way of thinking about it. I'll put those in the form of questions so that if there is dialogue, somebody wants to respond, you're more than welcome to do that. The last video I did on relics was more focused on uh, uh, the Roman Catholic Church. This is going to be a little more focused on the Eastern Orthodox Church because uh, icons really play a significant role within Orthodoxy. So let me dive right into this. Uh, just a few introductory comments. First, what are icons? Just to explain a few things, don't want to assume any background context here. Uh, basically, icons are... Uh, artistic creations of some kind or another. Often it will be two-dimensional, so a painting or something like that. Sometimes it could be a statue or something three-dimensional. Um, usually, and, and so it's used for religious purposes. So it's a, it is a very specific role, especially within orthodoxy, as I understand it. I'll try to state this as accurately as I can. Any orthodox viewers are welcome to uh, weigh in on the comments if I get this a little bit uh, wrong, or if you just want to add on to it. But so, so usually it's, it's it's paintings of some kind. You often, not always, it will be depicting a person, so Christ or an angel or Mary or a saint or someone like that. And within the Orthodox tradition, uh, they are often they are often spoken of as windows to heaven. They kind of have a more sacramental kind of function. Here's how the Antiochian Orthodox Christian Archdiocese of North America puts it. Quote, in the Orthodox Church, an icon is a sacred image, a window into heaven, an image of another reality, of a person, time, and place that is more real than here and now. The primary purpose of, ic of an icon is to aid in worship. Here's a couple of pictures of icons. This is a 12th century icon of the Archangel Gabriel. Here's a 6th century icon of the Apostle Peter. I mentioned sometimes icons aren't painting. Here's a metal icon. It's a Bulgarian icon of St. Nicholas. And then lastly, here's a picture of just how icons are often uh, uh, put in a home and used for uh, purpose of veneration, a kind of icon corner. So I'm not showing those, by the way, for any negative you know, purpose. That pro Sometimes Protestants have kind of a visceral reaction against icons. Uh, in fact, let me say at the beginning here, um, Protestants engaging this discussion, just two quick clarifying comments, framing comments, and then I'll get into the history. For Protestants, we need to be humble, patient, careful. It's really easy for Protestants to be too dismissive. It's just like, oh, you know, uh, this is one of those issues where there really is a deep divide. Um, Protestants do need to appreciate the complexity of this. So I've been thinking about this, and it's grown on me, especially when you consider the cultural differences. That So a lot of Protestants will often just quote the Second Commandment. Exodus 20, 4 and 5 says, Don't make graven images, therefore case closed. But one of the things we need to be careful with and we need to wade into this discussion is the distinction between worship and veneration that is valid. And especially as you look from one culture to another, there's all kinds of, um, let's throw out some of the terms, adoration, respect, honor, um, bowing, even kissing, that would fall short of worship. And a lot of these words and activities would have some overlap, like it could be worship, but it's not necessarily worship. I mean, so just to try to create some sympathy so Protestants will engage in this in a sympathetic and careful way, uh, think of a knight bowing down to a king to pay homage. Well, we would probably be able to say, okay, that's not worship. That's not idolatry, right? 
Well, stemming out from that, there's lots of other things in various cultures like that. And so we need to be careful to really listen to the arguments of the other side. One of the uh, things I want to say is to encourage people to read some of the historic arguments uh, defending icons, though I do not agree with John of Damascus on this. Uh, John of Damascus is one of my favorite theologians to read. He's like a window into a, a different world, the, the early Eastern tradition, and he's the main theologian that is drawn from in the iconoclast controversy of the 8th and 9th century that we'll talk about. And this is uh, in the popular patristic series that St. Vladimir's Seminary Press puts out. It's a translation and introduction by Andrew Luth, who's a really excellent scholar on John of Damascus. And if you read through John of Damascus, you'll get a bit of a, a just, uh, it's just helpful, actually. I, I actually think it's really enriching for evangelical Protestants to engage these issues and this conversation. Too often we just ignore them, and we don't even know what the arguments are, and we're just responding impulsively or emotionally to this. And we really need to listen to the arguments that John and others are making from the Incarnation and elsewhere, and just knowing this whole history. I'll never forget reading through this book, not to sound like too much of a nerd here, but probably if you watch my channel, you already know how <laughs> much of But uh, uh, so Greek, East, and Latin, West, Andrew Luth, the same guy, same press as well. This is a history of the church from 681 to 10, 1071, really looking at the East especially, and it gives a lot of attention to the iconoclast controversy. It's fascinating. So Protestants, we need to engage this carefully and, and listen to the arguments from the other side. And then my last framing comment would be for Catholic and Orthodox viewers. First of all, thank you for watching my channel. I know that it's not easy listening to the other side. Let me just tr say two things that will try to explain a little bit of where I'm coming from, because if you don't see a little bit of the background framework, then my uh, uh, summary of church history will probably feel a little strange, and maybe it'd be harder to sympathize with it or understand it. So just two sort of background issues here. One is the Bible seems to be very severe in its warning against idolatry. If there's anything that you would say is like the main point of the Old Testament, you, honestly, I don't think you'd go too far off to say uh, if there's anything that comes out and is em emphatic from the Old Testament, it's this constant warning against idolatry. You see it over and over, and uh, the people of Israel fall into idolatry over and over. It's, it seems to be this ha habitual temptation. In other words, idolatry in the Old Testament doesn't seem to be the kind of thing where if you just warn people about it once, then they know and then they're good. It seems to be the kind of thing that can constantly sneak in and we need to be vigilant to guard against. And one of the forms of idolatry that we see that is warned against is bowing down to images. So um, the second commandment, of course, of the Ten Commandments is the most famous example of this. It says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Here's another, there's lots of verses like this as well. Here's one, another one from Leviticus 26, verse 1. It says, You shall not make idols for yourselves or erect an image or pillar, and you shall not set up a figured stone in your land to bow down to it, for I am the Lord your God. Now, I can already just please don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not drawing a direct parallel just now between what these verses are condemning and the veneration of icons. That's the whole thing that we need to get into. That's the case that needs to be made. Okay, I'm not saying that. I am saying what I hope we could agree on, and that is this is a um, uh, a real temptation. Like, there is something that these verses are warning against that we need to be guarded against. And the second thing, kind of background context, is just um, it seems to be a sort of perennial human tendency to worship in the form of physical objects, like statues. I remember being a religion major and, and uh, reflecting on how diverse religion is. It's hard to even define the word religion, but one of the things that's almost universal, there's not too many things that are universal throughout different religions, but one of the things that is almost universal, you see it on every continent at almost every time up to the present day, is uh, worshiping through the use of physical objects or worshiping physical objects in some capacity. It's not totally universal, but it's very common. My, so what I'm trying to say is it will help you understand where I'm coming from if you know that I'm approaching this with a sensitivity to this, that I believe there's a temptation, a perennial uh, constant temptation within the human heart that, to fall into idolatry and that this is one form of that. 
of worshiping physical images. Now, again, I'm not saying that venerating icons is that. I understand that the strong pushback against that, but you'll you'll better understand where I'm coming from if you know that that's uh, a deep concern that is on the table. Like like let's say the issue of venerating icons was totally off the table. Okay, just wasn't even an issue at all. I'd still be thinking. Are God's people going to fall into idolatry as in the church age, like they do all the time throughout the Old Testament? That's kind of, again, background. So with that said, let me sketch out a Protestant view of church history in terms of how this issue develops. And I would say there's three phases. So phase one, I would say, is the first roughly 300 years or so of church history. Let's, let's say from the beginning of church history up until the conversion of Constantine in 312 and then the Edict of Milan when... Christianity is looked upon favorably by the Roman Empire in 313. So for that span of time, um, I would argue that the not only is there no, to my awareness, evidence of venerating icons, but many voices are strongly protesting any use of icons. Uh, and in fact, it's often seen as one of the hallmark sort of distinctive points of contrast between Christian worship and the surrounding pagan worship. So for example, you may have heard of the famous contrast or uh, uh, argument between Celsus, the pagan philosopher, and Origen. By the way, it's late at night and I'm tired, so I'm probably going to misspeak. Whenever I watch my old videos, I think, oh, I said the wrong word at that. So <laughs> Have have uh, grace on me if I, I say something wrong here. I'm going to cover a lot of historical details too. So uh, Celsus and Origen and that dialogue. Origen is responding to Celsus. Celsus is a pagan philosopher who's attacking Christians. One of the things he attacks them for is not using images in worship. And Origen's response to that isn't, oh, the distinction between worship and veneration or something like that. He just says, no, you're right. Uh, Christians, quote, being taught in the school of Jesus Christ have rejected all images and statues. Later on, he cites the second commandment, which I quoted earlier, and says, it is in consideration of these and many other such commands that Christians not only avoid temples, altars, and images, but are ready to suffer death when it is necessary, rather than debase by any such impiety the conception which they have of the Most High God. You get, so the strong language there, debase, impiety, you get this sense from a lot of these early Christians that there's this, um, there's a very strong sort of almost allergic reaction to the surrounding pagan practices and the distinction that is drawn is not, well, we worship, we venerate icons rather than worship them like you, but there's this more wholesale rejection of icons. Now, some would say, well, some would object to Origen's theology, but whether, this is one way I've seen people respond to him, but first of all, we're just looking at him as historical evidence. He's speaking about how Christians worshipped in the third century. Second of all, there's uh, so many like Origen who condemn. So here's another example from Lactantius. He makes this point many times. He's got this idea that God is too pure to be worshipped through images in any way. Here's, there's so many quotes. I'm just picking one, and I promise I'm not taking these quotes out of context, okay? He says, God is not to be sought in the nethermost, but in the highest region. Therefore, there is no doubt that there is no religion where there is an image. For if religion has its origin in divine things, then there is nothing divine except in heavenly things. Therefore, images are devoid of religion. You can see lots of other early Christians who make similar appeals. Uh, Tertullian, Athenagoras, Clement of Alexandria. Um, it even finds its way into local synods. So at the Council of Elvira, this is you know, frequently referenced in these discussions. Early 4th century, Canon 36 says, pictures are not to be placed in churches so that they do not become objects of worship and adoration. To my knowledge, there's not much pushback that you see to this. I would go so far as to say I think it's pretty clear that I won't say universal, maybe there's something I'm not aware of, but at least in churches, as opposed to in someone's home or something like that, for the in, used in the context of worship in churches, that it's the consistent position of this of the early church in this first phase to not use images in any way, let alone to venerate them. All right, then you get into phase two. And what you see is with the conversion of Constantine, things change. A lot of lot changes overnight. So Constantine, you know, builds these basilicas for Christians. He uh, appoints Christians to high-ranking offices. He gives tax, 
tax exemptions to clergy in some ways. Um, he returns a lot of the property to churches that had been confiscated under the persecution of Diocletian. So basically, overnight, suddenly you have um, a bunch of material wealth in churches. Now, Constantine does not, to my awareness in, in looking into this, put images into churches. But um, you do have suddenly a lot of institutional backing for churches. And so as the fourth century progresses, you do start to see images in churches. However, I'd say two things. First, um, throughout this period, so phase two is from Constantine's conversion and Edict of Milan up until the iconoclast controversy. And what you see here is a development, uh, the emergence and then growth uh, of venerating icons. And what I would say is, first, um, when you see icons coming in, you do not see them used as objects of veneration, but rather as objects of teaching and decoration early on. Now, not universally, I'm not saying every, I mean, I, again, it develops, it builds into that. But for the most part, early on, it's not like overnight, now everyone's venerating. No, early on, and, and this is one of the distinctions that needs to be appreciated because a lot of times people argue for icons, for venerating icons, and they just appeal to examples that aren't veneration of icons. Like, I believe that icons are acceptable to use for teaching and decoration. I think that it is a matter of adiaphora, which means things indifferent, which means they're neither commanded nor forbidden, and therefore they should be... Um, a matter of Christian liberty, and you should not require them, but you should not judge others for them. Um, I think that's a very reasonable position. Um, what I'm opposed to is venerating them and, and bowing down to them and things like that, and I think that that is wrong to do. Um, and what you see a lot in this period of church history, and I'll, I'll come back to that and give some examples in a second, is people are, you, are okay with images being put into churches, but not as objects of veneration. For example, one of the things, the claims you hear is, oh, iconography was in the Old Testament with the temple, with the Ark of the Covenant and the cherubim and that kind of thing. And then they just infer from that that this is like pro-veneration of icons. But um, no one was bowing down to or kissing the angels on or the, the, the cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant. Iconography is not the same as the veneration of icons. So um, I think I'd have to go so far as to say I'm not aware of any examples of venerating a non-living object in Holy Scripture, but I know this video is less on Scripture. So, so back to the phase two here. So um, the other thing I want to say about phase two is people are still, you still have that older perspective represented. It's not like everybody's on board with icons in churches. So the example that is often referenced in relation to this is Epiphanius, who he's a, uh, uh, I think he's considered a saint in the Orthodox Church. He was the bishop of Salamis in, on the island of Cyprus. And there's a famous letter where he's writing to um, John, the bishop of Jerusalem, and he's explaining he was passing by a church in a village somewhere in Palestine, and he saw candles outside the building, and he found out it was a church. And I want to read what he says. I went in to pray and found there a curtain hanging on the doors of the church, dyed and embroidered. It bore an image either of Christ or of one of the saints. I do not rightly remember whose image it was. Seeing this and being loath that an image of a man should be hung up in Christ's church, contrary to the teaching of the scriptures, I tore it asunder and advised the custodians of the place to use it as a winding sheet for some poor person. <laughs> so, and he goes on to, to uh, tell John that such images are contrary to our religion, and he instructs a presbyter in the church. Uh, he says that this is an, an occasion for offense, and so you get a very clear sense of where he stands. Um, I think the scholarship is, is pretty solid, that that's authentic. Some people have tried to say that it's spurious. Um, and that's 394. So this is, you know, late 4th century. Um, so you still have that. So you still have that older, like, origin and Tertullian perspective that you can find. But during this period, people become more open to using images in churches. But a lot of times it's for the purpose of teaching. So let me give an example of this from Gregory the Great. Right around the year 600, he's writing to another bishop who had been an iconoclast, meaning someone who destroys images. And uh, even though the language to this quote is kind of old, it's actually worth reading because it'll give you a sense of things here. So listen to his reasoning here. He says, 
Furthermore, we notify to you that it has come to our ears that your fraternity, seeing certain adorers of images, broke and threw down these same images in churches. And we commend you indeed for your zeal against anything made with hands being an object of adoration. But we signify to you that you ought not to have broken these images. Now, for the sake of time, I'll go on. But he basically goes on to say the images are um, used in churches for the illiterate. So people who can't read books can read the walls. And so, the, and he goes on to, to say more about why it's, so he says, what you should have done is don't destroy them, but also tell people not to adore them. Now, the point that's significant here is Gregory understands uh, images to be used for teaching. It's for the illiterate who can't read. But he, the contrast he develops is not veneration versus worship. Um, it's adoration versus teaching. He says, don't adore them, rather use them for teaching. Uh, he doesn't say, don't worship them, rather than, rather venerate them. Now, I've heard some claims that Gregory did, you know, his views are a little more mixed, and you can find people in this period who are kind of pushing the envelope. So I'm not trying to, again, this is gradual. So phase two is a mess. It's, it's messy. But I think Gregory's perspective in this letter is representative of what a lot of people would say. And you have to be careful about people misusing the fathers in this period. People will always quote Basel. And there's a quote in Basel where he's saying, um, you know, whoever venerates an image venerates what it portrays. Uh, but if you read that quote in context, what he's talking about is basically the Trinity. It's a theological argument. He's not talking in the context about icons or liturgy or worship or anything like that. So you have to be careful about people misusing the fathers here. But anyway, phase so that's phase two. Phase two, gradual increase. And, and, and it increases to the point where it starts to become a major kind of uh, fractionating issue, a major divisive issue. And uh, then you get to phase three, where this is the raging issue in the East. And it is a fascinating history um, that in the iconoclast controversies. And I want to I talk about the Seventh Ecumenical Council for a minute with this. So this is the one ecumenical council that with fear and trembling before God, I would depart from its um, primary conclusion, its, its main consequence which is, it does affirm the veneration of icons. I want to explain a little bit why and a little bit about this, the history surrounding this, because often it's framed that if you're a Protestant and you depart from like a, a lar, a, an ecumenical council like number seven, which is the only one I would depart from, um, that it's kind of like you as an individual versus the church. But I want to try to show it's a little more complicated than that. It's not the most helpful way to frame this. And that actually, even at this time, it was very messy. So earlier, in other words, a way to put it like this, although it's an ecumenical council, it was not a happy consensus. When we hear ecumenical council, we often think, oh, you know, the early church, what everybody in the early church came to. Maybe not, maybe not always, but eventually, by the time of the, the ecumenical council in question. Um, but this was a seesaw, back and forth, power struggle, highly political, very bloody, very vicious, and you've got the iconoclasts and the, and the iconoduels, those who uh, venerate images. It's a dark and savage history, and it helps a little bit to see. a little. So just a little overview here. I've been reading about this. It's fascinating, and it uh, really captured my imagination. So, so, so mid-8th century, you have another council, uh, the Council of Hieria, which claimed to be ecumenical but was not. And, and there's this massive um, upsurge of iconoclasm and opposition to um, usage of icons. Um, the empress at the time, later on, who's more sympathetic to I the iconoduels is Irene. She's the one who convokes, she's like a co-regent or something, and then she eventually becomes the, the regent. But she is the one who convokes, I think it was technically her and her son, Constantine VI, who convoked Nicaea II, the Seventh Ecumenical Council. So, um, after that, what you have is this back and forth power struggle where, so for example, Irene then later, because Constantine VI is involved in some way in some kind of usurping of power efforts, she has his eyes gouged out, her own son. She <laughs> gouges out her own son's eyes and puts him in jail and he dies. Now he, that person, Constantine VI, had done the same thing to his uncle. Um, and and other, he'd mistreated other family members. 
And this is what you see. So then Irene herself is then deposed and put into exile at one, uh, later on. And you just get this back and forth where each incoming emperor uh, will take the opposing side and persecute those uh, on, on the other side. So, uh, you know, you're reading this and it's just brutal. So Michael I becomes an emperor and there's a monk who had destroyed an icon of Mary and he has his tongue cut out for that. Well, then the next emperor comes along and a bunch of the bishops on, on the other side are now um, mutilated and castrated. Many of them are castrated by this incoming emperor. And this goes on back and forth like this. And there's this wave of iconoclasm in the ninth century after Nicaea too. Uh, I think one of the most brutal ones is Theophilus. He was the emperor from 18, or sorry, 18, 829 to 842. And he tortured a lot of the uh, iconoduals. So um, it's... It's really an interesting history. It's a really dark and grisly history. Now, I'm not saying that the grisliness of it invalidates the theological consequence. I mean, that would be impossible because both sides were very brutal toward the other. What I am saying this is just we need to appreciate how fierce this uh, contest was. And we need to appreciate that this was, although it's an ecumenical council, it's not a universal on the ground reality. In fact, after Nicaea II, there's a long tradition of dissent in the West. So Charlemagne convokes a council, Council of Frankfurt in 794, and they strongly condemn veneration of icons. They're not as, as iconoclast as Council of Hieria in the mid-8th century. They allow for um, icons to be used for some purposes, for teaching, for example. But, um, but they strongly oppose Nicaea II, and from that, you see a long tradition of dissent. Uh, if you want to read more about this, do a search for Claudius versus Jonas in the 9th century. So Claudius is a presbyter who's sent down by the successor of Charlemagne into northern Italy. He sees uh, lots of superstition and connection to veneration of icons. It poses that, destroys the icons. There's a big controversy there. And then all the way in places like what we would call Germany and into France, so like Germania and, and Gaul, um, all the way into about 1160, so mid-12th century, the um, adoration of icons is outlawed. So what I'm saying is don't hear ecumenical council, therefore universal view of every Christian uh, at, at least after this. It's like there's a lot of dissent that rumbles on. I'd also say that, you know, Another way, reason it's unfair to say if you disagree with an ecumenical council, it's you as an individual versus the church, is a lot of people. There's a long tradition of dissent to Nicaea II because, you know, honestly, if you read through the proceedings of Nicaea II, there's a lot of problems. They rely on a lot of forged documents in their historical case. Uh, so they claim support from things like the supposed letters that Jesus sent to Agra, I think his name was, the king of Edessa. So um, because there's a reference to an, uh, an icon there, there's other, f other forged or spurious documents. The usage of scripture is um, problematic in a lot of their arguments for how they're trying to justify venerating icons from scripture because that's a tough case to make. So they'll, you know, here's like an example of the, an argument that they make. It is written, thy face, O Lord, do I seek. That's Psalm 27, 8. Likewise, the rich of the people will pray or supplicate your countenance. Psalm 45, 12. But images are the face or countenance of God. Therefore, images are be, to be adored with prayers and supplications. It's like, I don't think that the Psalms talking about seeking the face of God are talking about venerating icons. Now, not all the biblical arguments are that bad, but it gives you a little flavor. So all to say, um, that's phase three, where it's still highly controversial, highly contested, but... It is the case that veneration of icons comes to predominate. So from that, let me articulate a series of, of uh, final thoughts in the form of questions. First one, since there is a development, since there does seem to be a trajectory, how do we know that venerating icons is not an innovation or a bad... When I say development in this context, I don't mean a good development like 
Newman's doctrinal development, I mean a bad development, something that comes in to the picture that is not apostolic practice, but is something, it's like I said in the Old Testament, idolatry creeping in. How do we know it is not that since we don't see this early on? Now, some people would say, well, you know, we can trust where the church eventually gets. We don't need to have that early testimony because of promises like Matthew 16, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, the other typical proof texts, the church is the pillar and buttress of the truth, things like that. I'm just not persuaded that those passages mean that an ecumenical, that if a council is ecumenical, it will be infallible. I do believe Jesus is always working in the church. I don't believe Jesus ever abandoned the church. I believe the Holy Spirit's been at work protecting the church in every nanosecond of church history. But I'm not persuaded that because of Matthew 16, we have to say every ecumenical council is right. Frankfurt was wrong and Nicaea too was right. I'm not persuaded that that follows from Matthew 16. And my question is, how do you know that uh, the decision of Nicaea 2 doesn't represent something like what we see in the Old Testament where the people of God fall into idolatry? Because it is not well represented in earlier church history. And from my vantage point, getting to the second question in, church, in, in Scripture. Okay, second question. What is the basis in Scripture or in early church history for this distinction between veneration and worship. I understand that worship, that distinction conceptually, but here's the worry. There's no, there's nowhere in scripture where you'll, you know, it'll say, don't bow down to the images in worship, but you can venerate them. The qualifications and the technicality, it feels like kind of a technical and overly subtle distinction. I don't see that the tone and the reasoning there seems so different from the tone and the reasoning of Scripture. Scripture's warnings are more wholesale. You know, how do we know this is an authentic distinction when it's not authentic to Scripture? Uh, third question. If we are to venerate images, why do we not see any examples, to my awareness, in Scripture of the veneration of non-living objects. Now, I know some people will try to claim that you know, there are examples of this in Hebrews eleven twenty one. I think it is, and a few. But I don't think there's any compelling examples of an object being venerated comparable to bowing down to an icon or kissing an icon. I don't think there's any examples of that in, that in Scripture. So, if that is a legitimate practice, why don't we ever see that in Holy Scripture? And just to justify a little bit this. Uh, distinction between a living object and a non-living object, here's how the Council of Frankfurt, which I just referenced, puts it. It is one thing to adore a man, that is, to greet him with the duty of a salutation and with the obeisance of politeness and reverence. It is another to adore a picture. For, we, for that we should show brotherhood, love, and reverence toward our neighbors. We are taught by examples of Scripture, but we are expressly forbidden to adore or greet images. And then it quotes the second commandment. That's from uh, Frankfurt. Fourth question, if icons are merely the object of veneration and not of worship, why do we see so frequently people looking to them for what we should only look to from God himself? Let me just give one example of this, and I'm not, so um, lest it be objected that I'm talking about abuses, when I read through the proceedings at Nicaea 2, the uh, proofs and the quotes and the, and the arguments and the uh, anecdotes utilized by the bishops to justify their affirmation of the veneration of icons are talking about the role of icons delivering things like uh, mediation for sin, making God favor, propitiating God, um, providing assurance of salvation, providing salvation itself. The role of icons seems to be seems to mushroom up into the realm of things that we should receive directly from the hand of Christ through His Spirit's work in us. Let me give one example. This is a quote that is falsely, because of forgery, attributed to Basel. He says this is one of the things that's that's uh, stated during the proceedings at Nicaea too. Quote: I accept the Virgin Mother of God, the Holy prophets, apostles, and martyrs who plead for me before God, here it is, that through their mediation, God may be favorable to me and may bestow on me the remission of sins, for which reason I both honor the histories of these images and openly adore them. 
the Protestant question would be, is this not, gosh, if we don't trespass a boundary there, what is idolatry? Um, what would it mean to, to look to an idol for what we should get only from God, if not that? Because is that not exactly what the gospel is? Namely, mediation with God via forgiveness of sins. Is that not exactly what Christ himself delivers to us? So you can hopefully feel the concern there. Here's my fifth and final question, and that would be, um, if, if you're still not convinced by anything else I've said, why not at least leave the issue of icons in the realm of adiaphora? That is to say, things indifferent. That, because these things are required in an Eastern Orthodox concept as a part of adequate worship. And this is ultimately one of the reasons why I'm a Protestant. For all the problems in Protestantism, at least they're problems that you can fix, you can work at. But there are things that are sanctioned and affirmed that I'd be required to do in an Orthodox context, for example, or in a Catholic context that would violate my conscience. This was a long video. I realize it's also on a delicate topic. If I uh, stepped, if I misrepresented anything, I, I welcome any pushback, but hopefully that will help you explain a little bit of a Protestant perspective, the kinds of reasons for which we would object to this practice, maybe even a little bit of just historically how we'd look at church history and say, even though something eventually came to predominate, we feel that it's inconsistent with the earliest practices of the first several centuries of the church, and therefore we think it is an error that, that should be opposed, just as God's people fall into error and idolatry many times throughout the Old Testament. Thank you for watching. Thank you, for, especially for my patrons who support the work that I'm doing, and may these videos um, build up the church. May they serve understanding. May they serve the cause of true unity, which is always in truth. And uh, I truly appreciate that you gave it time to watch. So let me know what you think in the comments, and God bless.